This week, Jim McMurray from ThreatHunter.ai is with us to discuss digging into the supply chain security. Then, in the security news, ahoy! New VM attacks ahead, HTTP2 floods, USB hit and run, forwarded email tricks, attackers be scanning, bunch of nerds write software and give it away for free, your TV is on the internet, Rust library issue, D-Link strikes again, EV charging station vulnerabilities, and rendering all cybersecurity useless. All that and more on this episode of Paul Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Are you ready to go beyond pen test reporting? Elevate your offensive security and measure risk reduction by streamlining pen test planning, report creation, and findings delivery. Request and attend a one-on-one personalized demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash PlexTrack and PlexTrack will send you a Starbucks $10 euro or pounds gift card totally free just for your time. That's securityweekly.com forward slash PlexTrack. When it comes to ensuring your company has top-notch security practices, things can get complicated and time-consuming fast. Now you can assess risk, secure the trust of your customers, and automate compliance for SOC 2, ISO 27001, HIPAA, and more with a single platform, Vanta. Vanta's leading trust management platform helps you automate evidence collection, unify risk management, and streamline security reviews. Save hours of work by completing security questionnaires with Vanta AI. Go to securityweekly.com forward slash Vanta to watch their on-demand demo. That's securityweekly.com slash V-A-N-T-A. And welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce you to a man who fondles his electrons, Mr. Paul Sidorian. Coming to you from Purgatory Studios in semi-high definition, compliments of Darth Vader himself, this is Paul Security Weekly, episode number 824, being recorded on Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian, joined by the illustrious Mr. Larry drinking warm beer, oh, Larry Pesce. Yeah. yeah warm so, beer. Is it it, warm? It, it, it's it? a little bit on the warm side, and this yeah. is not some, a good... Some jackass accidentally unplugged the refrigerator. Jack Asadorian? Yeah, Jack Asadorian. That's yeah. my alter ego that unplugs refrigerators when no one's looking. Yeah, I figured that one would be okay warm, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, apparently not. I should have stuck with a Guinness instead, because that's a little bit okay warm. But yes. Just, just mean, but the ice is cold, so that just means... The ice is cold. Bourbon. That's good. That's good. Right? I'm, the glad bourbon. The, I'm glad the ice is cold. Yes. Uh, Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. Jeff, welcome. My ice is also cold. And, I was uh, going to ask if your ice was also cold. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And I it love how he good. delivered that just deadpan. Miss <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mandy Logan is here with us. Mandy, welcome. Good evening. Um, I was thinking about an issue from childhood that I haven't ever figured out. Isn't it like the worst place in the world for her to sell seashells at the seashore? Yeah, because uh, yeah, that's, you know, because <laughs> can't you just get them there for free? It's a like, good one. You should probably take right? those into a landlocked state or something. You're right. Man. <laughs> it's sort of like, like the selling ice to Eskimos. That's yeah. right. And the ice is warm. Right. <laughs> Cold Mr. ice. Mr. Josh Eskimos. Marpet. <laughs> Josh Marpet is here with us. Josh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's it. Yeah, well, Jim, it's it's the equivalent of selling cold ice to Eskimos. Like, what's the point? Wouldn't warm ice just be water? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> That's a state change, Electron Fondler. Uh, All righty. <laughs> Some announcements on the evening of Monday, May 6th, 2024. W2 Communications and Cyber Risk Alliance are bringing cyber tacos back to San Francisco. If eating free tacos, sipping on margaritas, and mingling with cyber professionals from all over the world sounds good to you, make sure you register to secure your spot by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash cyber tacos. You had me at tacos. That's right. And and we really need some of you international folks to sign up, so it's a true statement. That's right. Yes. Uh, Let's see. Um, uh, Our listeners are invited to be part of the prestigious 2024 SC Awards. Entries are officially open. The SC Awards continue to serve as a beacon of excellence, recognizing the industry's best solutions, organizations, and people that are advancing information security. This year, there are 34 categories, many updated to reflect trends in artificial intelligence, 
cloud security, and continuous threat exposure management. Oh, that's a mouthful. I don't even know what that is. This is your chance to shine among the brightest in the cyber world. Take advantage of the early bird rate by April 12th and visit securityweekly.com forward slash SC awards to submit your entries by May 31st. All righty. Wow. We are excited to have Jim McMurray, the founder of ThreatHunter.ai, with us today. Jim is a leader and innovator in the cybersecurity industry, recognized for founding ThreatHunter.ai, a forefront, <coughs> excuse me, that wasn't intentional, Jim, <coughs> a forefront company in developing advanced AI and machine learning based solutions for threat detection and response. His leadership has propelled ThreatHunter.ai to notable success, em- emphasizing not just technological innovation, but also a keen focus on cybersecurity's evolving challenges. And I'm not going to read the rest. I'm just going to introduce Jim as an awesome person. My friend and fellow whiskey and cigar drinker, Jim, welcome to Paul Security Weekly. Let's try that again. Jim, welcome to That's where you say something, Jim. (laughs) (laughs) He's got cigars and whiskey. And the founder and establisher. And establisher of Betcon. You're you're allowed to talk, Jim. (laughs) Am I? Are you sure? (laughs) Yes. However, you will be known as Electron Fondler after that. <laughs> the, the hard part for me was was looking at Paul and going, what is that on his face? Aww. We're still trying to figure that out, What's too. His face? Oh, is it my beard? My glasses? What? It's called, a, it's called a soul patch, if you must know. <laughs> or schmut, or schmutz. This time. schmutz. Yes, I thought schmutz. Paul was looking very youthful today. Well, then why? Thank you, Mandy. Yeah. Wow. It's just because as we have- in juvenile or juvenile. <laughs> yes. yes. No, that's yes. his yes. humor, not his face. Resembles his <laughs> <laughs> remarks. Well, that's why you know I bring people like hi, him Jim. Because, Welcome because to the show. Younger. <laughs> Love you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. Uh, and that's about all that we have time for today. <laughs> Thank Darn you, those supply chain attacks. Uh, Goodbye. Uh, Jim, but, uh, Jim, you've not been on like a proper Paul's Security Weekly show before. No. Uh, I have well, not. We have to, now we have to ask you how you get your start in information security. Oh, man. I don't know if I can remember that far back. <laughs> I mean, if Jeff can remember, you can remember, Jim. Come on. Oh. <laughs> Well, first, I, I, I'm thankful that Jeff is wearing that awesome shirt today because that, that is, really is a cool shirt. Indeed. It's a very cool mm-hmm. shirt. Indeed. Yes. Yeah, the, the person that puts on VetCon is, is also very dapper and handsome as well. Yeah. Not me. Some other you. <laughs> Some other the guy. other person. So, Jim, yeah. if we go back wow. in the how time machine, how do you want to go? I just, so from, information in the beginning, security, I, you know. Star implies the beginning, Jim. It would take too long. Don't explain. To sum up. <laughs> and in summary, oh, oh. Jim is okay. now the founder of ThreatHunter.ai. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was born, and now I own ThreatHunter.ai. <laughs> Somewhere there were stone tablets involved. Somewhere. Somewhere. Stone tablets. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, I can see how this interview status has, go. has been conferred. <laughs> it's already going in so, this direction. So go ahead, Jim. Uh, I had a... Um, An unusual upbringing in that my father was one of the first employees of Fairchild Semiconductor. And he stayed with Fairchild uh, for 45 years until the day he died, literally. Um, He was a VP uh, at at National Semiconductor after they bought Fairchild. So I grew up around computer systems. I grew up around building and hacking things. And then I decided to take a turn at age 17 and join the Coast Guard. I was in the Coast Guard for a number of years doing uh, uh, law enforcement, boardings, counting fish, I like to count it, I call it. Um, and I got out in 93. And m- because of my father, I got a, a job at a company called Combinet as an engineer, helping to build ISDN products for Japan, you know, for a customer base in Japan. And oh, uh, through the dot com era, I was a IT director, security director, network security director. Um, and then after 9-11 occurred, um, I worked on a couple army projects along the way, Land Warrior. I built the, the personal area network for the Land Warrior systems, which is now known as Future Combat Systems. Um, uh, after 9-11, I got invited to 
work at a company called the Aerospace Corporation uh, in El Segundo to be their director of security in charge of both cyber and physical security. Did you leave your wallet? Did you leave your wallet job, there? Moved to Southern California. W what's that? You said El Segundo, and I asked, did you leave your wallet there? I left many wallets there, actually. Gotcha. <laughs> You're why they have the song. I get it. I yes. Get it. Yeah. Um, and then I worked there for a couple of years and decided, you know, uh, working for a quasi-government agency really wasn't for me again. And uh, went to work for a, um, a startup called Vernier Networks. Oh, yeah. And was uh, the head of the engineering team making a Layer 2, Layer 3 network access control system. And they decided to do a pivot and change the name, do all sorts of stuff. And so I convinced them to sell me their intellectual property. And that's how I started Milton Security. And that was in 2007. And then through from 2007 to 2017 timeframe, we were pretty dedicated into network access control. But we, we sort of grew into SOC as a service, MDR. Mm -hmm. And then two years ago, we changed our name to be ThreatHunter.ai. For the record, the question was, how did you get your start? Not your whole life history. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to just dump it all in there all at once. <laughs> no, it's fine. Let's go back. Let's go back, though. Um, your dad was working with very early ch chips Semi and semiconductors. Like, if I do yeah. the math, Jim, you were pretty... Tell us about that. Like, how did that, how did that come to be? And what kind of early stuff were you able to play with back then? Well, let's see. So he made the first um, silicon extrusion, extrusion machine in, in the United States. So he developed. What is a silicon? Uh, what is a silicon extrusion machine? <laughs> so when they make that? when they make wafers, right? When they make a wafer that they're going to use a lithograph machine to put the circuits on that wafer, correct? You mm. need a, a great amount of silicon, and it, and it came, comes out as a tube. You extrude it out of this giant machine. So he, him and two other people created the extrusion machine that actually extruded, and I think I have it here somewhere. Shit, I thought I did. Um, uh, uh, two you could probably eight. hold up anything and we would think it was yeah. the extruding machine. Yeah. You're like, oh, yeah. Whoa. That's <laughs> cool. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's wow. cool. Isn't that cool? <laughs> um, so... So from that, you would extrude a long tube of silicone out. You'd let it cool, and then you have a slicing machine that would come back and, and slice uh, uh, wafers off. Then it would you know, be polished, and then it would go off the lithograph to be uh, imprinted with the circuits. And of course, at that time, you know, you're, you're talking there primarily A to D and D to A, analog to digital and digital to analog circuits. Mm -hmm. And very simple number of transistors because we're talking 1957, 1958. Um, he was uh, the other group of people that started Fairchild Semiconductor came from a place called Shockley Labs in Menlo Park, California. And Dr. Shockley is the one who, along with two Texas Instruments guys, actually hold the patent and the first, the claim to the first um, uh, integrated circuit. Mm -hmm. And these group of guys got mad at Shockley, who was kind of a neo-Nazi, um, decided to leave. And my father came along with them, and they started Fairchild together. I gotcha. I gotcha. And, mm -hmm. and eventually, Fair all, did, did all that get rolled up into Intel? Is that, could you, you no, so, so Andy Grove actually worked for my father in the early 60s, along with um, the founder of Cypress Semiconductor, AMD... Mm -hmm. um, uh, a bunch of other firms, but they all left. And, you know, he actually got an offer from Andy Grove to leave in 1967, uh, 67, 68 time frame. But I was a, I was a newborn kid, and my father said, "Hey, you, do you have medical insurance?" And, no, not yet. This is a total startup. We're just bootstrapping this thing called Intel. And oh my, my father said, "Well, uh -huh. I need insurance." <laughs> and yeah. Oh, mm. <laughs> uh, but but it was a really fascinating time to grow up in the Bay Area because that's where I'm from, born and raised in right. Palo Alto. Um, you know, everywhere, no matter where you went, there wasn't as many people then, of course, in the Bay Area. You know, the founder of, uh, of Atari uh, lived yeah. three blocks away. 
you know. Didn't Jobs uh, didn't Jobs work at Atari? Yeah, uh, Wozniak worked at Atari. Yeah. Okay. Um, and did, did you and, go to Homebrew Computer uh, Computer one Club? One of the programmers then, uh, of. Yeah. So, my father was a member of Homebrew Computer Club, and him and That's I would amazing. go um, quite often. Um, I actually worked at a place. Th this is a real side story here, uh, called Call Computer, and Call Computer. Um, I was an intern. I was a very young man. There was also a number of young men working there, age 14 to 16. And um, uh, the guy who owned Call Computer, his name is Alex Cameron, later was arrested for child molestation. But he I ran. I had a funny feeling this is where that was going. <laughs> <laughs> he Same ran thought. something called uh, uh, a multi user system where he rented out the Vax mainframe that his father had bought for him to all the businesses locally to run their accounting. And there was a guy there. So he was the first uh, cloud provider. By the name of John Draper. And Oh, ooh. Jesus, Captain Crunch. Uh, yeah. So, wow. And so I worked for John Draper. I was a 14 and a half year old working for John Draper. Um, and part of John's- I'm um, just not gonna say it. Anyway. Do you, do you yeah. need a hug? Fun is to, yeah. to uh, well, not that kind of hug. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he also was friends with Wozniak and Jobs, and he mm -hmm. made blue boxes for them. And that's how yep. um, they made money. He, they, would, they would buy the boxes from John, and then they would drive over to Berkeley, and they'd sell it to students at Berkeley. No and shit. That's how, I, that's how I met Steve Wozniak the first time, was because I, uh, Draper had to leave early, and Wozniak came over and gave me money, and I gave him the box full of blue boxes. Um, so, dude, so when I, you watched the movie Pirates of Silicon Valley, you were like there. Yeah, I, I wasn't there. There, you know, I was a, I was a, you know, a teenager. But yeah, yeah, sure. That's yeah. awesome. He, he was adjacent. Hmm. Nice. Um, so from there, I, I, I started because of my father um, started a bulletin board system called RCPM Palo, uh, Palo Alto RCPM. Um, start off with a Chromemco S100 system with two 8-inch floppies and one single phone line coming in. And that uh, evolved over three years into seven K-Pro K Pros and then a few K-Pro 10s, which are, you know, 10 meg drives. And I had four separate phone lines running. What year did you re retire the use of 8-inch floppies, out of curiosity? <laughs> um so when we got the K pros, which were five and a quarter, um, that was eighty two, maybe eighty three. Gotcha. Um, so I still have my Chromemco, the original one that my father and I built with eight K of RAM. Because the 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 nuclear launch code system that uses used eight inch floppies that was only required <laughs> uh, retired in the last two three years. So wow, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember uh, 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 buying the notcher so I could use both sides of the eight inch floppy. Uh, this is before double sided double density. Uh, you know, I, I moved from a one ten modem to a three hundred to a twelve hundred. Uh, to a 24.4, to the 36.6. You speak demon you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But along the way, personal things got in the way, and I decided to join the Coast Guard. Mm. And my father, why, of course... Why Coast Guard? Time, why Coast Guard and not another uniform service? Why... I, I sort of broke up there. Why Coast Guard? Sorry. Why, why Coast Guard and not Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine? Um... I wanted to go and save people. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Pure and simple. Um, and I, I had seen a few things before. And I went to MEPS, uh, just like every other branch of service. Um, and actually, a friend of mine and I were going to sign up w into the Army together. Um, but we got to MEPS. We did our MEPS in-processing. We took the ASVAB. I scored a high 90s. Um, they then sent us all home at the end of the day. Um, and the next morning 
uh, at my parents' house, I got a call from some guy named Chief. And my mom wrote that note. I still remember. James, some guy named Chief called. Here's his phone number. I have no idea who it is. So I called the guy and he said, I, I saw you, you went to MEPS yesterday. You took the ASVAB. Have you thought about uh, joining the Coast Guard? I said, I thought about it. Uh, but there are no recruiters around. There's no recruiting offices for the Coast Guard in the Bay Area at that time. Hmm. And he said, tell you what, I come to your parents' house uh, this weekend. And why don't we talk it over? Don't join the Army in between. <laughs> uh, and and at that time i was only i was not yet 17 wow um so that weekend he came over of course my parents were dead set against me doing it i graduated high school when i was 16 my parents were dead set against me doing it i was kind of an asshole I said if you don't do it now when i'm 17 when i turn 18 i'll do it anyway and you won't see me again uh so uh, they signed me out. Uh, they agreed to, to it. The Coast Guard recruiter, um, then after we signed all the papers, then tells me, you know, you can't swear until you turn 17. That was in two more months. And then there's a eight month wait before you can go to recruit training. I'm like, wait, <laughs> eight months? He goes, yeah, we're backlogged. Oh, geez. Well, wait, so you, you wait until after I sign, then tell me how long I have to wait? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did say so, he was a recruiter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But um, about a month later, we got a phone call from uh, the Coast Guard office in Fresno saying that someone had dropped out and uh, they had a bus ticket waiting for me. And I was to take the Greyhound bus from Mountain View to Fresno, which really, if you were to drive back then, maybe it'd be a three and a half hour drive. But it was a nine hour bus ride. <laughs> oh, because it stopped at every little podunk little city along the way. Right. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I swore in on my, uh, actually on my birthday, uh, uh, March 25th when I turned 17. Nice. And what year was that? And what was your mother's maiden name? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, 1938 yeah. and Smith. Smith. Gotcha. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. So yeah, uh, fast forward so Jim, to today. Uh, yeah, fast forward, <laughs> yeah, fast forward to... How did you found Milton Security? Well, like I said, I um, uh, worked for Veneer. They were doing a shift. They decided to do something different. And I felt bad for all the customers that had paid um, support monies to this company. And they were just basically going to file bankruptcy, mm -hmm. knowing full well that they just took money from over 100 different companies. Oh, I felt geez. bad. And I, I turned around and said, I tell you what, I'll make you a deal. You sign over the intellectual property. You can keep the money. Uh, but I become the support company for these devices that have been deployed all over. And of course they readily agreed. I went home, told my wife, Gosha, Hey, guess what? We now own a business. And she got all excited. Great. We're going to make a million dollars, aren't we? No. Oof. If anything, we're, we're going to be flat broke for at least two years because we had customers <laughs> that had already prepaid support for uh -huh. a couple of years. But I did it because I believe then, and I still believe now, the um, security is really, really important. And um, I believed in the product we were selling and we had, had developed. Uh, we had actually sold the source code and our newest equipment to the NSA, who was using it as well. Um, had OEM the, the code to HP, and HP had put it into um, the 4500 and the 5200 or the 5100 uh, series as their access control system. So I, I, I truly believe that this was going to be the coolest thing for a couple of years, but I knew eventually um, all of that would be part of the network inf infrastructure, not as a separate product. Mm. So that's how I started Milton. And I just, you know, by myself for the first year, then the uh, first hire was uh, in 2008, December of 2008 was my first hire. 2009, I hired two more people, and those two people are still with me. And that's, that's a testament. Um, you know, right now, the the time period, the shortest time period that we have as an employee is four years, and the longest is from 2009. That's amazing! Wow. Yeah. So, how do you um? 
you, when you work with clients today, I'm sure you've a lot of thoughts on supply chain security, uh, which is the the topic. Does that come from your customer interactions, Jim, or just observations or side projects or? I think kind of a combination, right? We all see what's happening in the industry. We all know that that this is an issue, uh, and it's been an issue. You know, it, basic security, you know, your username, your password, two-factor, that's all basic stuff. So is supply chain. You know, the vendor that's selling you that piece of software that's going to be on your endpoints, they didn't make everything that's in that piece of software. They have a, a an S-bomb, right? They have a bill of materials for their software. They, they pull pieces in from from open source projects, from things that they buy from other people, and they call it their own, right? But, but what are the implications of that? Um, mm. And, and I, I always make fun of people that uh, install Homebrew on their Macs mm. uh, because you know they, they unknowingly, every time they, they open a console and they say, hey, let's do brew update and, and brew upgrade, you know, they're pulling in pieces from all over the place that may or may not have been audited and you don't know where they're coming from. Um, another great example is the XE issue that arose uh, last week, right? And I think you guys talked about that last week as well. We did, yeah. Um, you know, it, there are all these pieces and parts that are out there that, that are used to build our infrastructure and, and it only takes one little piece, that XZ component, for instance, to, to mess everything up. Um, and what I, what I love about that, and I think you and I have, have chatted briefly about this, Jim, is that I, I think there's an opportunity for us to do better in the sense of detecting these supply chain issues, I'll call it, right, as an overarching term. And that is because it's, it's one thing we get a piece of software, we can find vulnerabilities in it, right? There's known vulnerabilities, we can pull it apart and look for vulnerabilities. And that that's one thing. And then on like the other side of that, skipping over the supply chain piece, we can use EDR and other technologies to look for bad behavior, right? To look for threat actors doing bad things. Right. But I feel like this gap we have in the middle is how do I know the software that I have has integrity and is doing what it, what it says it does? Cause that's different from finding a vulnerability and that's different from Correct. I've already been compromised and I'm trying to detect what the attackers are doing. Right, and and I think that's a great uh, segue into. You could almost view everything as a supply chain attack, right? Every single vulnerability, because what is a supply chain attack? It affects a large number of people in a large number of verticals. So every single vulnerability under that definition is a supply chain. But truly, I believe a supply chain attack uh. is when you are 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 utilizing that piece of software that you sold, in the case of XZ, um, and you're doing something nefarious with it, that that normal red teaming or scanning or reverse engineering isn't going to explicitly find, and, and your behaviors may not perfectly find either. There are going to be these things in the middle that aren't going to be found, and you're relying on that vendor to be honest and truthful with you that, you know, Everything in that piece of software has been vetted and tested and ensured that it is it is not going to do you harm. And and I'm I heard gonna, I heard Josh I heard Josh go yeah eh. Josh Josh was mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. so I mean like look if, if I have a vulnerability in a piece of software that a thousand people are using, and then I go and compromise nine hundred of them or whatever, is it a supply chain attack because I found a vulnerability in a single piece of software? And is it a supply chain attack if I find that somebody's using a piece of software which doesn't have a vulnerability, at least that I know about, but they've implemented it badly. So the only way I get at them is them. It's not anybody else. They're the only one that implemented it this badly. And so I can get at them, but I can't get at anybody else because of it. Mm -hmm. Is either of those or is one of those a supply chain attack? I mean, so I can argue your definitions. Okay. However, I mm -hmm. respect the fact of what you're saying. I would think that if we're going to go by your definition, my first example where I can compromise a piece of software that maybe a thousand people are using as a supply chain attack, I would say I think that a supply chain attack is when I can get through a piece of software and that somebody's using and deploying to other companies, other people, other areas, and I go through mm -hmm. them to get to something else, somebody else. So in that in that scenario, um, the Fortinet vulnerability a couple of weeks ago that right. I could get into a, a using that vulnerability 
I could then get into a manufacturing facility that does manufacturing, right? Is that a supply right. chain attack? That's a great question. I love it. This is the gray area in between. I love that. Um, the answer is maybe. Now, if you said I can get into the manufacturing and induce a bad piece of firmware, I can corrupt the firmware in the widget that they're making, thereby getting, you know, uh, Paul right. all anxious and excited. Well, in an Careful, attempt to... Rising. So, but that, but that, that would be the supply chain attack. The supply chain attack wouldn't be someone that has a vulnerability that gets exploited. So this is the discussion. If there's a vulnerability that is widespread, multiple companies are using it, and you figure out a vulnerability, effectively you have a zero day on that. Oh my God, Jeff is so adorable when he does that with his hand. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, shut up so I can talk. Go ahead. <laughs> So in an attempt to level set, can we, can we try to distinguish what, a, what is and isn't a supply chain attack by who's uh, responsible for remediating, patching, fixing the vulnerability? I'm sorry. Was that a question or a statement? Well, it, it is, is it's a question? a question. I mean, if, you know, is it a supply chain attack if it's just software that you're using that a patch is routinely issued and – you know, it, you know, you're responsible for getting it installed. Is that a supply chain attack or is it you're using software where there's something that's out there that really the provider should be the one that's fixing it? To me, that's more of a supply chain attack. Uh, so my yeah, question think- is, it, it, who who's responsible for fixing it, remediating, remediating the problem or providing the remediation? Okay, so- yeah, I think, well, I think, I so hold question. on, if we look at, if we look at it like this, like a chain, right, has two, two links, if you only have two links that are linked together, that's not really like a chain, that's like a, it's like a key chain, or so I don't know what, what you call it, right, <laughs> so like in the, if you've got software provider, it's called a there, Venn right, diagram, software. I think, well, no, two links, <laughs> not three, so you got a software uh, company, and they, let's just say they write the software all themselves, Right. And then they Mm -hmm. sell it to customer, customer implements it as a vulnerability and the software provider patches vulnerability and customer applies the patch. To me, that's not a supply chain. I think you have to have more links upstream to call it a supply chain attack. I also think it doesn't matter how many people are using the software. Mm -hmm. That doesn't define whether it's a supply chain attack. You could have one software company that has three upstream providers and that software company sells that software to, to one business and one of their upstream suppliers has an issue that's still a supply chain attack. Agreed. Well, I mean, if, if, we're, you in, know what? if we're infusing opinion, <laughs> is it a supply chain attack if you're relying on third parties and managed service providers, managed security providers to, to deliver some of the, the security so, things that you're supposed to be funny doing? You, it's funny you ask that, Jeff, because I, sometimes I just say supply chain issues. Mm-hmm. And because I don't want to specifically say it's a supply chain vulnerability or, or it's attack. a supply chain threat or it's a supply chain attack, because conceivably those could be three different things. If there's a vulnerability in a library and I incorporate that library in my software, to me, that's that, that's a supply chain vulnerability, right? But in the case of XZ, where there was a malicious actor specifically tampering with and backdooring software, mm-hmm. that is a supply chain attack that could ultimately end up as a, a supply chain threat. I guess. So let me rephrase my question. Are we just talking software? I mean, Paul, you work for a company that oh, seeks boy. out hardware, firmware vulnerabilities. I mean, yeah, I mean, firmware is just software that's inconvenient to program. So let's just <laughs> throw that out there. So and we're talking software when we say supply so in, chain, in the hardware without any software is just like a paperweight or decoration at that point. Cause it's not going to do anything without, without software. But are we, are we so limiting, actually, are we limiting the definition of only software. thinking about electronic I'm devices? There. Hold on. I'm getting okay. there. So there are hardware supply chain attacks and mm-hmm. threats and vulnerabilities. In, in my, in like my experience and looking at the history in this, all this stuff, they are much less frequently occurring, right? Because the, an attacker has to get physical access to a system in order to put some kind of hardware in there or no, they don't bribe someone, bribe someone in a, okay. No, they don't Josh bribe someone in a manufacturing plant and say, Hey, I want you to put this chip in instead of the chip you're supposed to put in. 
fine. Uh, but I think we can all agree those are much less frequently occurring than a, a supply chain attacks against software and lump firmware oh. in there as well. Agreed. Agreed. But all you have to do is increase sodium hydroxide at the water so, plant. All you have I to do is... You, but, uh, anyway. <laughs> I agree with you, but I also think... Let me ask you this question. Theoretical. This may or may not be happening right now. Um, let's say there's a company out there that sells a piece of software. We won't define what it is. And that piece of software is bundled by many different software firms that is present on hundreds of thousands of endpoints around the world across verticals. And they could be from logistics companies to even cybersecurity companies that may, may or may not have this piece of software. Um, uh, but, what you're, uh, but what you're talking about is uh, Google Analytics. Okay, let's, right? let's call it Google, let's call it right? Google but, Analytics. But, but, but bear with me for a moment. I want analytics on my website. I'm not going to write a whole bunch of software to track visitors to my website because it's, it's not 1992 any longer. And so I have a Google account and I go to Google and I say, hey, Google, like create me this thing in your cloud and then give me some code to run on my website so that it's tracking the analytics, it's sending it all back to you and you're doing all the analysis. Then I can log into this wonderful dashboard in Google and go, oh, look at all the analytics for my website. Right. Correct. I mean, it's essentially Google it, Analytics model. It, 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 let's think of it that way. Yes. But then on the Google Analytics side, you're not collecting credentials. You're not collecting. Um, It'd be pretty neat uh, if unique we could, identifiers though, huh? to every one of those people that. Uh, uh, you mean like they're tracking cookies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. I I could see. Sure. On one hand, th this is you're going to somebody's website and you're tracking them that way. But on this on this example, it's 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 on systems, servers, devices that encompass a wide range of functions. And would you consider that a supply chain issue? If if that firm that provides that piece of software is breached. It 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 depends on what happens with the with the breach, right? Okay, give me an example. <laughs> I mean, if they just breach the if they breach Google to get at the analytics stuff, but they've maybe they've tainted analytics so that. They've got a back door into all those other companies. I guess you're, now you're breaking my two chain two chain link thing. <laughs> I think that was Jim. the point. Yeah, thanks. For that, that. <laughs> we're, we're getting you there, Paul. We're nudging yeah. you there. There's more. There's more to supply chain than just software. I think is what we're all saying. Right, but it's different and, and, from. And, it's different from. We can all agree it's different from vulnerability, though. Correct. Correct. Even I, though I would say, in the case of XE, it, it, it gets it, a CVE. It's who, but. Who's vulnerability? I mean, vulnerability by definition is a weakness. And so, you know, vulnerability, it's not a, it's not a, a, a bug in the software, but there, or a misconfiguration, but, you know, action or inaction of individuals can be defined as a vulnerability if it's a weakness. So. Sure. I think, I think we're we having a I, I think we're having a discussion about software related supply chain attacks. And I'm fine or with Or digital that. I would call it digital supply chain attacks. Is that Well, I mean is patch better? is Microsoft Patch Tuesday I mean we are we talking about op operating systems and and you know thing things associated with whatever they call it this week Microsoft Office 365 any issues <laughs> with that? Is I that mean, a supply chain attack? This year because of leap year. I thought it was uh, on, Entra. Is it Entra? Is that? It's Entra, or, or or is it a supply chain attack if Microsoft doesn't know how uh, an attacker got uh, master keys for Office three sixty five, and uh, and <laughs> Azure AD? Depends. How did they get access to those keys? Well, they don't know, Jeez. but they got oh. access to them. Then I, then I don't think we could say whether they it was a supply chain attack or not. 
I mean, it was to an me, attack. a supply chain it's... attack is simply exploiting a, a, a target by, you know, uh, attacking somebody other, some entity or organization other than the primary target. To me, that's a supply chain attack. Okay. Supply. Well, did you I just read that? First... Did you read that from Wikipedia? I did not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I'm the first to love definitions. I'm just riffing. I think we should probably talk about how to stop supply chain attacks or how to detect supply chain attacks or how to deal with them, perhaps. Jim, talk to us. I was kind of, but I was kind of enjoying defining the terminology. I know, I and really, I agree, <laughs> but I we've only so got so much time. It's, it's so problematic to define terminology in our business. Let's just it really it. flipping it. is. Assuming we all know what it means. Yeah, Jeff, it, it all depends on what your definition of is is. Exactly. Oh, boy. Oh, yes, crazy. Clinton, thank you. We could put a compiler in. We could all take a compiler. Oh, not the compiler. Oh, my God. I feel like that's going to go to, like, I'm binary, therefore I am. And so, like. Wow. That's clever. Like I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> we may have to do that somewhere. <laughs> We need we need a sticker. I'm binary, therefore I type. I don't know. Um, <laughs> therefore I hack. I, I'm binary, I Jim, therefore Jim I hack. I don't know. Jim There's only ten types about, of people in the world. Jim was going to about Schrodinger's <laughs> supply chain attack. <laughs> Schrodinger's. You may or may Wait. not have been hit by a supply chain attack. That's right. You will not know until you open your wallet. Now that kind of <laughs> goes to a question that I had, but more about s bombs because. Uh huh. <laughs> Well, in talking about this, just a simple thing on S bombs, how often is it that somebody's actually going to compare an established S bomb and actually find rogue components? All the time. Do they? Like Jim, is that your depends, experience too? Depends that they on constantly who you are. Well, stop, 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 stop. When you say rogue no, components, no you mean don't, don't do this. Right. But if you do it, when you say rogue components, do you mean put in by a malicious adversary, Mandy? Or talking about rogue components meaning the company fucked up the S bomb? I think they have to have the, the S bomb. Or more importantly, they didn't fuck up the S bomb. They fucked up their build and included a whole bunch of stuff that they shouldn't have in that final build. Or, or they they simply aggregate fifteen libraries into something yeah. that they built, and then and then by that layer of aggregation, hide the fifteen out of date, EOLD and Absolutely. you know libraries that they shouldn't be using anymore. Um, to, or to, they to totally you. lie. To yep. answer one of those questions, um, I don't think there are, and, and Jim will probably back me up on this, I don't think there are many companies that uh, go and check for rogue components in their software bill materials and that they've actually been used. But I'm hoping to change that after my talk on May 8th at 8.30 in the morning at RSA. <laughs> <laughs> really? How convenient. <laughs> I, like I wasn't even paid. I wasn't what, even paid to bring that which, subject which, up. <laughs> what day of the week is that? Fine that state. Is that Wednesday? That would be, but Larry, that would be I, I would agree with you, Larry, that, that of the 200 plus customers that we have, not a single one asks for S-bombs, reviews S-bombs, or anything of that nature. Hell, most of them can't well, understand it, how to read the -bomb, damn things. But an S-bomb's going to, let's level set here, an S-bomb's going to tell you that you have XZ, yep. right? It's not going to tell you if XZ has been, has been tampered with. Correct. Right? So we need to well, make sure it, we, it, we, it will not tell you if it's been tampered with, but it will tell you that you have the version it in your you environment have. if someone else has tampered Correct. with it. And it's if only it. somebody Correct. was Correct. monitoring, you know, news sources, vulnerability reporting agencies that would know that XB is a problem and they had a resource for looking up, is this something that affects us? Is this mm, something that right. impacts us? If there, only they had a way you of know doing it. Interesting. A, a, a little side like shift here. Hold on. A little Vex. side shift. Go ahead, Jim. So, so we also do um, uh, NERC CIP assessments, North American Electric Reliability Council Critical Infrastructure Protection God, Act assessments, tabletop exercises. Um, NERC it's SIP. not yeah. red teaming. It's it, it, it's NERC SIP, it's, it's tabletop, it's blue. It's, it's, it's pink teaming because assessment. you're not really doing it. It's pink teaming. Right. It's, but, a, it's but, I mean, it's a, but, a real world implementation of the holodeck. But the great thing about doing those things, which I think, you know, NERC has, for all its problems, NERC has really tied down, you know, I want to know what's on every single system that is running, and I want to know the S-bomb for every single item that you're running within the OT network. 
And and that they create this, these giant spreadsheets for every single system that are then audited quarterly and then verified by guys like me that come out and go, okay, yep, that's exactly what's all in there. So when those when XD came along, they knew already. All it took was someone to walk over to one of their systems and go, hey, do we have this? Oh, we do. It's on these 12 systems, yep. last audited last month, and this is what we need to go do about it. And what right? cyber that, tool and did you use amazing. to look that up? I'm guessing. That, uh, it, well, I'm guessing it was Excel. It was Excel. <laughs> <laughs> it might, there there exactly might be other right. companies out there that could do similar types of things <laughs> that may be a little bit better finance state. Oh, <laughs> <that's, laughs> <laughs> Brought to you by Finite State. <laughs> Come on, Paul gets his Eclipsium plugs in all the time. I'm taking it full advantage. I know, I'm not even wearing my Eclipsium shirt. I know, but my, your shirt but you know, on the What company is that? Eclipsium? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's... that's yeah. I think yeah. this is Josh, the longest... The, 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 Josh, this is long. <laughs> Jeff, the company is called Eclipsium, I think is what we were saying. Well, and I was saying, I think this is no, the no, longest no. stretch of a uh, of a so, podcast so think, where we've think... we've had Paul <laughs> shut up because he's like, "There's more to so- supply chain than software attacks." What? <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I have a whole slide on that. Paul, if you <laughs> worked at Finite State, you'd understand better. Anyway, yes. <laughs> go ahead, Jim. I, I think that you know, taking that same NERC model and applying it to all of my customers. I would love to do that. I would love that if there that there was a tool that can make this super easy. I'm doing a plug here. Super easy that <laughs> every single time something came out, they could easily look up and go, "Am I affected by this? Yes or no?" Because right but now, but that implies, but that implies you've got in in uh, in asset inventory, which I think we throw this term around of asset inventory, and the classic definition for us older folks when we say asset inventory is oh like when we buy laptops for everyone and when we get the laptops in we, we put, put the little metal an, tags on the back we put a metal tag on that that's like super hard to remove right and then it's an asset tag and now i've i've done an asset inventory because it's every right next to that in, warranty and, thing that says you know warranty void right. if you i've taken the, the serial number from the laptop i've manually entered it into a spreadsheet and i put a sticker on it this is property of my organization, and therefore I've, I'm doing asset management and asset inventory. Okay, I actually okay. This is, we've moved. Dis- we've I moved actually on. disagree with that, Paul, because I did an asset inventory with a company 20 years ago, and they wanted to like write down the, all the serial numbers of all the systems. I'm like, your assets are the information. Let's talk about what you have that's valuable and where is it. And Monty, kind of it's all about circuits. the information. All about the information. Okay, I want to point out something that's actually kind of important. Every time we talk about this stuff, between S-bombs and supply chain and whatever, we start talking about different levels of the software. There's the data, there's the, the I mean, there's the, the information, data, knowledge, wisdom pyramid, if, if you've not seen that, about what's actually valuable. In terms of the software, there's what level of the software. We talked about aggregation of libraries to hide them from the S-bomb. Uh, and, and then there's also the fact of what software are you using? And that's the asset that most people, when you hear, you know, software asset inventory, they go, okay, I have Excel, I have Word, I have SAP, I have Archer, whatever, right? But then there's all the different pieces of all the homegrown and third party and whatever else and plugins, integrations, APIs. There's so much there these days. It's almost unthinkable to do an actual software asset inventory. So I love your point about NERC SIP, Jim, but it's... At, at, at a company of any great size, it's a monstrosity of a project, let's be honest. Well, even, even in a small size, can you imagine a three-person dental office doing, a, doing that kind of inventory? They, they don't a, even know what, what Windows 11 is. They're still on Windows 7. Windows 7. They're using Dentrix. <laughs> uh, you yep, know, yep, yep, uh, yep. <laughs> you know, th- there are so many things that, that for small businesses, they have no clue about. They don't yep. have an understanding of this. They leave it up to, to luck. They leave it up to their MSP and yeah. hope they pray that their MSP is doing the job right. And they pay horribly to make sure that their MSP, because they get the cheapest MSP they can find normally. And that's why that, so many of the smaller MSPs compete on price and it's a race to the bloody bottom. But that's why I asked the question of whether MSPs are included in the conversation of a supply chain attack. Oh, I want to, yes to and no. They 100%. have to be, but 100%. I want to go into 
and we're going a different direction because we've only got so much time in this first segment. <laughs> and and I, somehow I we have article. to tie it into Eclipsium. Go, Paul. No. Wait, I read this <laughs> article, and it was from Dark Reading, uh, Tips for Securing the Software Supply Chain. Now, I'm not picking on the – I think it was George Hume that wrote the article. I'm not picking any of that, and you had to go register. If you didn't want to pick on them, you shouldn't have named them. I know. I, so so I guess ahead. I do want to pick So on go them. ahead, Paul. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but so in the article, there's a quote that says – Enterprises can't blindly trust their technology environments from their user end user endpoints to third-party suppliers or the open source components they rely on. But we, we all do. But yeah. We all just blindly trust, right? Whether enterprises, users, whatever it is, we do oftentimes mm-hmm. blindly trust. So my question to the esteemed panel is, what, what can we do to make it so that we don't just blindly trust. Shit but we're not a panel, out. we're an interview. What does Jim have to say? Yeah, what does Jim think? You sort of broke up there. So restate your question for me. <laughs> <laughs> In the article, it says enterprises can't blindly trust their technology environments. How do we, when we all do, uh, how do we move from blindly trusting to actually trusting? Zero trust. Yeah, that, that's a really hard question <laughs> to answer because I don't think, um, even if we went the level of NERC CIP level um, of verifying every single component, you know, um, even that there's there's gaps, there's problems, there's issues. And, and I don't think that we will ever get to 100% of being able to to trust everything that we get from our vendors. <coughs> you mean you're just so you're saying we're, your we're screwed is, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> to, to some extent, I, I think we, you know, that's why we all have jobs, right? Uh, totally. just, uh, because of this issue. Hey, speak for yourself. We, you know, there are... <laughs> Uh, because that there are man-made tools that have issues with them and can be leveraged for nefarious purposes with or without the knowledge of the person providing the, the, the software. So basically what you're saying is there's a new iteration of on a wing and a prayer. Like, <laughs> yes, Mandy for the win. <laughs> yeah. That was the best quote ever. Oh my God! <laughs> Touchdown! It's like, so how's your software okay. supply chain security? Wing in a prayer. Wing in a prayer. Wing in a prayer. Because this, should be a, this should be on surveys and uh, <laughs> but, but challenges but it, but to like, like compliance and stuff. We got to fill out the survey. But it's, it's, what are you files. doing? About, what are you doing about supply chain risk management? And there's like like but, nothing. There's like, it. you know, we're wing doing it. all the things. And then there's like wing in a prayer. Option but in, D all, is, in all fairness to Mandy, <laughs> in all fairness to Mandy, she said it's the new version. So it's wing in a prayer NG. That's right. <laughs> True. The next we're generation using wing in a prayer, prayer NG technology from threathunter.ai. <laughs> you, you, yeah. You know, what, this... Part of the forms that they make <laughs> for the new CIP is, is there other things that will, will mitigate or find Issues that may occur. Wing in a prayer. <laughs> Wing in a prayer. Wing Dude, G- that is NG awesome. Generation. I need to start using that in more things. <laughs> Somebody needs to type that into chat GBT and see how it gets interpreted. Because yep. then that, <laughs> that would be and truly... the title to this episode, Wing in a Prayer. Wing in a Prayer. Zero Trust, Wing in a Prayer. Create a website for a, a, prayer. Cybersecurity, <laughs> create a website well, you know, for cybersecurity company to... called Wing in a Prayer NG. <laughs> I'm, st- I'm hold on. I need to register that name before John. <laughs> Wing in a prayer NG TM trademarked. <laughs> Too late. Copyright. I already registered it. <laughs> Too late. I already registered it. No, I'm kidding. I'm- no, that's good marketing. Are you currently Wing in a prayer? Why not try Threat Hunter? <laughs> 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 that's, that's a business plan. Start a company called Wing in a Prayer, Wing in a Prayer, and offer nothing. <laughs> No. That's our business plan yeah. is we offer it, nothing. It'd be like the Seinfeld episode. What's your product? <laughs> nothing. We make but, nothing. We do nothing. But Vandalay we will tell Vandalay you. Vandalay Industries. Yeah. We will give you gold stars. We will tell you you're doing awesome. <laughs> we're the low cost leader, and we're in a prayer. <laughs> I'm going to throw this idea out at RSA to all the venture capital receptions I go to. I've got this idea for a company. 
God. We'll do absolutely nothing. <laughs> nothing. And we're going to call it Wing and a Prayer. <laughs> and we'll make t-shirts and it'll be wildly popular. Okay? <laughs> we'll, call, we'll sell cyber insurance called Wing and a Prayer. And it's absolutely <laughs> nothing when you find a claim. <laughs> I think I found nope. my niche. There's no premiums, but there's no payoff do. either. The terrifying thing is that would probably work. It I mean, would. that's what cyber insurance is now, is winging a prayer. Yes. <laughs> we this pray is... they'll cover us. Yeah. But you know, go, going back to, to I think, um, Paul's question, or was it Josh's, is the MSC, MSP that supply chain? And, and I would say it is. That was my and question. I, give, oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. It's your question. Um, God damn I would it. say it is, you know, so every quarter, every three months, um, um, each of my team members are to go and offer their services for free to a small business and including myself. So I have two this quarter that I'm working on. And one of them actually is, and I think Josh and I spoke about this on uh, Signal, um, a dental office in upstate New oh, yeah. York yeah. who had entrusted an MSP to uh, make sure that they were safe and secure because, you know, it, it's a single dentist, six people work for her. Um, and, you know, she's not a computer person. She's not a technology person. And she went to the best of the brightest uh, MSP and she relied on a company called Dentrix to, to make sure that her systems, you know, were backed up and, and encrypted and, um, you know, safe from bad people. And what actually happened was there were no backups. Dentrix doesn't encrypt. Dentrix didn't back up anything. Um, the MSP did not back up the virtual machines ever. Um, they, don't make, they don't look at the logs. Um, the firewall was two years out of date. It was a Fortinet firewall. Uh, they had oh, RDP yes. open to the internet. You know, so what you're God. saying is wing and a prayer has already been taken. <laughs> yeah, they had that. They got that down. And, and, and it's clearly because of... <laughs> and it was clearly because of, of, I think, the inaction or the inability of her provider to keep her secure. Meanwhile, they're telling her every month, don't worry about it. We got you covered and here's our monthly bill. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I have had, a question. They had four different remote access. They had any desk, they had a uh, uh, Rust desk, and, and they had ConnectWise, an old version of ConnectWise, and another RMM, all installed on every single machine. PC anywhere? We're going to have anywhere? backups. They had backups. Should but have no backups. backups. But no back there's no backups. No backups. Oh, I mean, backups to the remote <laughs> access so that everybody can <laughs> yeah. have Oh, okay. Right? Everyone. <laughs> that is a and form of backups. Yeah, everyone. it is. And they had given her a username and password two years ago for her to VPN in. It's never been changed. Um, but then you then forget when, it. Uh, and then, exactly. And then when she couldn't get in one time period, they said, don't worry about it. We have another way. Just use remote desktop protocol from your machine at home. We opened it up for you so you can have access. What's what's worse there, in Jim, in that scenario is they probably have contract language that has limited liability to the cost they of, do. The, of two the contract. months, and, yeah. and 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 so they're on the, the you know this dentist was putting their trust in this entity, and this entity is like eh, right? But we're making but we're making money, um, and. You know, someday, when, Paul, we need to have a conversation about regulatory requirements, you know, similar to what Corman was saying the other week about, you know, that last, I forget his terminology, but, you know, the last stop in terms of software, but also the last stop in, in terms of managed services and people that you're putting, putting your trust in. Because that's largely unregulated. Nobody's stopping them from whoever the company was that was providing the service. I forget the name already. Nobody's stopping Do you them remember, from doing it. Jeff, you're my age. If not do you, older, do you remember, do you remember uh, back in the '90s when when the term network engineer was becoming very popular, mm. and especially in California, the actual uh, principal engineers, the PE group in California and in Texas, were saying you can't use the term engineering because you have to be licensed for that term. You have to right. pass a test. You have to do this. You have to be certified, etc. You know. 
in a way, I kind of think we need to do that with MSPs, MSSPs, threat hunting right. firms, et cetera. Right. They, they, there has to be some certification process, not SOC 2, because SOC 2, I think, is meaningless. Um, but, but I do think there needs to be a due diligence done on providers of security that help more than one customer. Metric. Yeah. Okay, what would you metric to, to do that certification? Oh, sorry. In in Jeff's defense, um, he probably doesn't remember the '90s because he's old. He can't remember whether he put underwear on this morning. Oh shit! <laughs> oh shit! I do remember the sorry. '90s? That was sorry. cold. Mm -hmm. That was I mean, just I'm, cold. I mean, when you're not wearing underwear, it is a little cold. It'd be chilly. <laughs> yep. Did sorry. I wear underwear in the '90s? Huh. Ask me if it was boxers or briefs. It no, depends. no. Let's, uh, I have different questions. I have five questions for Jim. Jim, are you yes, ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Let's do it. Okay, I'm ready. Three words to describe yourself. That's one. Paranoid. <laughs> whiskey. Valid. C cigar. Caring. That's it. Three. Anxious. That's four. That's and more cigar. Than three. <laughs> You just you overflowed the buffer, Jim. <laughs> Jim, if you were a serial killer, I what know. would be your weapon I, I of figured choice? <laughs> Say that again? Sorry. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh. Oh. Ice bullets. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? I remember that movie. <laughs> um, where the Red Fern Grows. Oh, wait. That one's taken. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. It's purple. Purple uh, fern. Where the purple fern grows. <laughs> All right. I like purple too. I just got a purple phone. I'll talk about it. Talk oh, about it that later. next question is the big one. What is your favorite hacker movie? Sneakers. Yes. 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 Sneakers for the win, Paul. At some point, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to tally up the votes, Jeff. And like we make do. this official. Every time someone <laughs> we're, answers, we're, we're gonna have to have a whiteboard back here. Uh, we need a whiteboard. Yeah. Every time someone no, answers hackers, no, I get a no, point. You know, no whiteboard because I know you will erase shit. We need it to be permanent marker. But but, yes, but now you have to ask the <laughs> other question: Why sneakers? Okay, why? Mm. I'll, I'll 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 take that. I'll take you up on that, Jim. Why sneakers? All right, because allegedly it took place in the Bay Area. Yep. And if you remember, the sound of crossing the bridge, that's the Dumbarton yes. Bridge that goes from East Palo Alto to Fremont. And I, and I lived maybe four miles from that bridge. So when that was in the when we went to the movies to watch it, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is this is the Bay Area. I know that bridge. <laughs> and, and where they took people to was the old Sun Microsystems building. Oh, really? Oh, so <laughs> the part <laughs> where they're like counting the little. Yep. yep. That's and, and, the Dumbarton no, no, Bridge. No lower. Yep. 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 And then it had a repeat. I, I live four <laughs> miles from what used to be the Key Bridge. <laughs> there you wow. go. Uh, last question, Paul. Okay. And it has nothing to do with bridges. Uh, choose two, uh, three. Choose three celeb. No, choose two celebrities <laughs> to be <laughs> your parents. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. <laughs> Alan Turing. Nice. Nice. Good. And uh, Elizabeth uh, Friedman. Benjamin Franklin. Nice. Nice. Very nice. Okay. Uh, Jim, are you sticking around for the next segment with us? Of course I am. Fantastic. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back with the security news. Stay tuned.